Beep, beep, beep. From the telecenter, it's the PM Show with host Paul Hanover. Thank you. We got the everything's coming up noses bit again, eh, Joe? Well, welcome to chapter two of the summer doldrums. And I certainly would like to start out by thanking the many, many hundreds of people who greeted my first appearance last night with indifference. <laughs> no comment. They said no news is good news. Actually, you did enjoy it very much. Wound up with a terrible headache uh, after the show. Too bad it wasn't a toothache because we had the dentist here, but just my luck, I got the wrong disease with the wrong doctor around at the same time. While we were waiting to come on the show, I was uh, happened to be wandering around the telecenter here, and I noticed that this is the same studio that's used by Don Webster for his uh, Channel 11 dance party on Saturdays. And there were all the top songs listed for everybody to see. And I said, well, the songs are all right, the hit parade songs, but I think we've got the wrong people doing them. So I kind of realigned the hit parade I'd like to give you my version of how the hit parade songs should be actually recorded. Of course, there's that uh, very cute novelty out today. I used to use them that greasy kid stuff. I think your Brenner should have done that one, personally. Roses are red. I'd like to see Nikita Khrushchev come out with the top record of that. Secondhand love. Well, you can almost look at the international headlines and put your own name in there. Uh, theme from Ben Casey, of course, T.C. Tommy Douglas would do a very fine job on that one. One of the newer ones on the way up is called Gravy. Uh, Vincent Feely and Jay McDermott on the OPP label might be able to carry that one off pretty good. Pick Up the, key, pick up the Pieces, of course, by Prime Minister John Diefenbaker. And Dream Big by our friend in Quebec, Rio Couet. There we have our uh, top seven songs, according to uh, my international hit parade. Well, enough of that. We uh, do have some interesting guests once again. Uh, one from the United States, one international, and yet another from the Toronto and Canadian scene. They'll come along, but after uh, we have... Do I have this word on? Oh, we introduced the first guest last night. I remember we had a commercial right off the bat. This is a slow night. That means the paycheck will be a little slim by the time we're through. Well, let me introduce the first guest. He's the one that hails from the United States and uh, is in the fascinating business of uh, cameras. And we all have uh, opinions about cameras. We all have uh, probably take pictures as a hobby. But this fellow's picture-taking is the type of hobby that you and I don't think will ever come close because he's involved with photography in space and how it came about. He's very closely connected with it and probably be able to give us some inside information on some of the behind-the-scenes incidences in the v recent space flights. So let's welcome from the United States, Mr. Phil Mikoda. Phil? <laughs> welcome. Just take your seat right there. Did you bring a lot of American money with you? Well, I uh, brought all the money that the local uh, bistros in our area couldn't cash in. Couldn't so cash they in. they saved their Canadian money <laughs> and give it to me to bring back and redeem. Have you had any... Uh, how, many, uh, how long have you been over here now? Well, since Sunday. So have you had any uh, arguments with the currency exchange? Or? No, I had gotten quite a discussion with a lady that had visited Baltimore once and was quite put out because the lady uh, that she... Uh, that was paying for an item in a drugstore, refused to accept a Canadian penny, and we oh. <laughs> settled that in the usual way, you know, no usual. one won. Well, the, um, the, the project you're here on now is for the company you work for, and I think we may as well mention that. It's a renowned firm called Ansco. What does Ansco mean once we've stretched it out? Well, Ansco uh, is Anthony and Scoville Company, is the way the name came about, D-A-N and the S-C-O mm -hmm. from the Scoville bit. We've been manufacturing photographic products before our, all of our times combined back in 1842. You don't go back that far. No, no all I, of us combined might from the ages that is. I, I know our makeup girl is good. I didn't think she was that good. <laughs> and we have uh, been there uh, in Binghamton now for a good number of years. And, and we've produced a, quite a number of first in photography. And you're and in Canada for what purpose? For the well, film? we have just uh, announced that we are going to build a million dollar plant in uh, Cooksville 
on Stanfield Road, which will be uh, quite an addition to our present uh, ANSCO of Canada function. Right. We'll be manufacturing all of the fine films, which are... How come there are always million dollar plants? Nobody ever builds a half a million or a million and a well, half? Well, <laughs> I think it's like the 99 cent sale, you know. <laughs> I think yeah, in, when you're in business, you make it big, and when you're in... How many years have you been with ANSCO now? Well, uh, I understand that there's a 20-year pin waiting for me on Friday. Oh, you're right out of school, practically. Well, yes. I, what school did you attend? Well, I went to Rochester Institute. I couldn't get into a banking school, which I'd rather go to. I wanted to know about money, you know. This is the time to know about it. Yes. <laughs> you went I, to Rochester? I, yes, Rochester Institute. What a rebel. A Rochester Institute, and he works for ANSCO. How would you ever get away with that? Well, it's very simple. At that time, I uh, found that uh, I could get three dollars more at ANSCO than I could from any other photographic firm. Per week, that is. Per week. Imagine how they felt in Rochester. He deserted us for three dollars a week. Well, we enjoy the competition that it has afforded us. You've uh, worked your way up to, I think it says, public relations. What does this actually involve now, Phil? Well, uh, we are not uh, enormous in that we don't have every individual in our organization slotted for a specific job. So I am primarily concerned with uh, public relations, but in addition, I sort of serve as ANSCO historian, and, and the most fascinating thing, of course, is to get the free trip to Cape Canaveral every time there's a liftoff, and this is, of course... Your, your firm has got... I look after the space photography end of our company's business. They got sort of the, the tie in there. And well, we, uh, we are quite proud of our first... Uh, we, the first film to record the behavior of an astronaut in space was a very fine high-speed ANSCO chrome of ours. And we recorded the monkey, Enos, mm -hmm. and, and allowed him to use some of our film and take some pictures, too. And then uh, we were very, very pleased when Colonel Glenn's uh, requirement, and incidentally, you'd be interested to know that the, uh, the pilot, the, the astronaut, uh, if and when he decides to take on special assignments over and above uh, those that are required mm -hmm. by his uh, leaders, he has a choice in the matter. Right? He says that this is what I want. Well, Colonel Glenn said he wants an automatic camera. He does not want to be bothered with the decisions that have to be made in camera taking. In picture camera taking. and picture taking. Well, the era of automation helped us, and out of the, about a field of 25 automatic cameras, we were quite pleased that the Ansco auto set was selected for you. Is this it here? Yes. Uh, this camera is a, a replica. The grip, of course, was put on to permit him to hold it. His requirement was that the camera permit him to operate the film advance mm -hmm. with his left uh, uh, hand and also to trip the shutter, you see. It's all in one operation. He can all in one. flip the picture and snap at the same time. The most amazing part of this was that he had to, with gloved hands, open up this camera. With gloved hands? And load it with 35 millimeter film, which is a narrow little wedge like that. But he did it successfully, and out of the 72 pictures, which he actually made, and you will recall one of the rolls got away and fell behind the, oh, the instrument mm -hmm. panel, out of the 72 that he took. We have about 38 of them here, along with some other scenes, sort of background to space and space photography. And we'll be able to see these now. Yes. Well, as a matter of fact, um, Phil brought along uh, a, s a slide uh, projector. Uh, this is my, must, uh, must be my week for slides and showing pictures. We had the dentist on last night. I was holding up pictures of various uh, dental problems. Oh, that's really? Right. Photographs? I, I, that's right. Wonderful. And I don't have to uh, hold the pictures up here, do I? No, you we'll don't. Show these? We'll, we'll do well, it. while we're talking about pictures, I get the cue that uh, there's one coming to uh, Hamilton District that uh, is quite fascinating, and we'll get the story of that right now. <laughs> and that was uh, our musical group for the evening, Matt Kennedy and his White Horse Trio. <laughs> no relation, though. Playing Flying Down to Rio, dedicated Eddie Gilbert. Anybody understands financial news these days? A lot of piano. That fellow gets his money's worth out of a piano, I must say. And I was um, commenting earlier here when we saw the Hattari announcement. A lot of us were invited to meet the cast of Hattari there in Toronto yesterday, as a matter of fact. There was Red Buttons, Elsa Martinelli, uh, Bruce Cabot, or Cabot, whatever it is, and the, the star John Wayne. They came Monday, and I was mentioning this the other day that I don't know why they came to Toronto, because John Wayne was in the Toronto District five times on Saturday. I was checking the movies Saturday night, and there was five movies playing. He was in four of them, John Wayne. As a matter of fact, he won the war in three of them. 
<laughs> and he just missing, I think uh, Randolph Scott beat him out in winning the war on the other one. Uh, you uh, have an unusual, uh, now just notice the spelling, M-I-K-O-D-A, Phil. Uh, a name like that, you should have your own camera on the market. It's very uh, close to a camera brand name. Well, it would be interesting, and I won't mention the camera name. <laughs> I prefer to mention Ansco, like first that, with the yeah. finest. It's a very famous uh, Japanese uh, uh, Gilbert and Sullivan opera. They're very close well, to Well, uh, I'd like to tell you just one little story. For years, the feed man in our area used to call on us and deliver grain and all, and, uh, and he uh, never cared to ask my mother where father was. He worked nights, and one day he finally asked his children, we grew up to be 12, your father Japanese? Over the name M.I.K. Yeah. Well, let's get to these pictures, and uh, we'll just flick them as they go on, and as they go on the screen, you just tell us the story behind each one, Fine. would you, Phil? Off oh, to Cape Canaveral with Phil Makota and his camera. Uh, quite, most of us are always concerned about uh, space uh, cadets, so to speak, astronauts in space outfits. I thought perhaps your Canadian audience and those on the border of the States would like to see what astronauts look like. You know, they're people. Behind the and scenes, eh? This is, this is how they look in their various training they courses. Are. They're on uh, a coffee break like the Here you have uh, uh, Commander Shepard, and you have Grissom, and you have Carpenter in that order, and Glenn with his back to the camera. Here is another view of them just discussing their plans. This was just prior to the Grissom flight. Grissom at this point knew pretty well that he was underway. Here is, of course, our first suborbital astronaut, Commander Shepard, in an attaché case like any traveler <laughs> carries. It was lunch. And here again you see uh, the uh, backup pilot uh, for Colonel Glenn. Here's Colonel Glenn. He also has to drive himself around the wide expanse of Cape Canaveral. There's only one way of getting there, and that's by car looks or like he's plane. Looking, it looks like he's looking for the cold refreshment about there. Well, this could be. It's awfully Somebody warm Somebody forgot to there. bring the beer. <laughs> uh, here he is with his friend Carpenter. And wonders what's going on. And here we have... Grissom still trying to remain cool just before his orbital flight, suborbital that is. Mm -hmm. Here you have Dr. Vos, the crew cut boy with his hand, uh, leg on the fire plug. He's the fellow who looks after the psychological problems of the astronaut. This is the front of Hangar S and this capsule which is the one that uh, Grissom will ride in is being taken out to install on top of the uh, redstone rocket. All nicely packaged and Yes, yeah, all and wrapped, ready for... Nice Christmas present for some young lad. And this is what the Mercury Redstone complex, so to speak, looks like at a distance. Uh, uh, the gantry standing there loud and clear. And I always get into them to turn in with my expense account. <laughs> And here, of course, they're discussing rockets, I guess, and not fish. <laughs> and here the retro rockets are being installed just before installation on the craft, on the rocket itself. They really are explosive, are they? Is that what the signs there for? Yes, they are. Look out. As we well know. It's, it's a lot smaller than you'd imagine, isn't it? Well, it is. Actually, of course, he's, uh, the back of the capsule is about the height from the seat of your pants to the top of your head. Yeah, you know, huh? and, uh, it's a very small affair. This is where they say, are you sure you want to go? Yes, I think that's the, way, that's the look they have, you know. Here the uh, capsule is now uh, connected to the hook, and up it goes. Pretty good. Uh, do, you actually, do you take these yourself, Phil? These, yeah. These. So you had the big badge and everything to get on? on. Well, uh, it's easier to get on as a press photographer than it is as a technician, so you have to <laughs> wear two hats, you know? <laughs> Up it goes. Yes. You can clearly see the rocket package on the bottom that uh, Colonel Glenn had so much trouble with. Mm -hmm. And we're just about ready just, to go uh, into the greenhouse. You see the greenhouse mm -hmm. there, and of course these are in... Uh, Ansco chrome, and it's difficult uh, to uh, imagine why people call this thing a greenhouse, but there it is. It's green, and it mm -hmm. looks like the plastic uh, awnings that you see 
around home. Right now, patio. This is his own little patio up That's there. That's right. The um, have great. Uh, excuse me. Go ahead. They have great problems getting correct color rendition in the greenhouse because all the light is taken by color, by green yeah. light, you see. And so they get a lot of green faces. We're seeing them in color, by the way. The folks at home have to stick yes. with the old way. But it's coming through quite well there in black and white. Now it's ready to be tucked in. Yes, and it'll get dropped in on the top of that little checkerboard surface there that you see just up above that lower portion of the gantry. Mm -hmm. Is this uh, Colonel Glenn's? Uh... No, this is the one for Grissom. In oh. a moment, we will be on Glenn. I didn't get any good before pictures on the Glenn, Glenn flight, and this, I think, is quite interesting to see what a tiny little thing this is mm -hmm. that goes 100 miles in the air. See, this is a redstone rocket, but the same Mercury capsule that Glenn uh, rode in, the same and type, just a new number, serial number, it's the only difference. The doors are closed there, and it's all ashore that's going yes. ashore, eh? Now, uh, we are ready to go into the first manned orbital flight. This is now resting just a few feet off the ground, and actually it looks as if it's standing still at this point. How close and were you? At this point here, about just under 3,000 feet. This is as close as you can get, and so you have to depend on telephoto lenses, of course. Mm -hmm. This is just a changing of the guard here for a moment. This will give you some idea of how uh, extensive these uh, holdings are that we have down there with the gantry cranes and all. Um, this is the same rocket. Of course, the very first thing that the suborbital pilot or uh, Glenn would see would be this coastline of Florida, the east coast with the Atlantic and the clouds underneath. And it's very clearly visible to you. You can see the hump. Miami would be right about where that little square is in the lower left corner. That's, there's somebody sending a message, send money fast. <laughs> yes. uh, recognize Miami immediately. And the first thing you know, all you see is this puff of clouds uh, in the sky. How high up would we be with that shot? Well, that... Uh, it would be difficult to say. I would say that's probably five, ten miles wow. uh, at, at that cloud point. Of course, by this time, uh, Commander Shepard, who was backstopping in the uh, uh, house there in the blockhouse, was a little concerned, and at this point, seems to smile, so we like to feel that the man is in orbit. That was the first A-OK -okay coming through. That's huh? right. Uh, now, here is Colonel Glenn in the very, very first 16-millimeter photographs taken of him uh, mm -hmm. during... Uh, 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 that Was that your camera up in the... Uh... Well, it's r just above his left hand there, you see a little dark area, and later we'll see him reaching for it when he sees the beautiful view. Well, who took these pictures? Oh, well, that's an interesting got, one. Well, this one... That turned... looks like my kind of pictures. <laughs> well, well, who t took the pictures of him in the... Uh, in the... Um, itself? Well... We're having a little technical these, problem. Uh, these uh, pictures that... Uh, uh, were taken of himself, were taken mechanically with a piece of equipment. I think I'll have to open that and unjam it there. Is it jammed? Yes. Well, uh, can you unjam it? Uh, I, I well, we can show him unjamming. Everybody wants to know how you unjam it. All righty, let me unjam. This is this the is only projector. I'll get a commercial in here. It's <laughs> the only projector that you can unjam by yourself. You don't have to return there it to the are. factory. We may as well show everybody that we're in trouble. I didn't know he was trying to fake it. Otherwise, you'd have to return it to the manufacturer. Uh, and there we are. You see, it's no. as simple as that. We're unjammed. Now, is this the same tray we were using? No, is, have you got it there? Mm -hmm. Good. Because we left him up there ready for his first picture. Yeah, oh, there we are. Here we okay. are. Now, you see that little string that hangs way up there on the left-hand side? Uh, Where do we get back on that picture there? Oh, we didn't have to flash up picture trouble temporary there. We just <laughs> faked it ourselves. Now, that little string you see there on the left, of course, he had uh, originally, um, uh, he put that there uh, to retrieve the camera in case it drifted away. But uh, now, now he's taking pictures at long last. And just like all amateur photographers, the first ones were not sharp. Actually, in his case, it was only because the capsule was apparently bouncing Shaking about it. in the air, mm -hmm. and so the first three scenes over the Atlantic here are not crystal sharp and clear. Well, I couldn't argue with it because I've never seen it before. Myself. Now he's coming ahead, and uh, or the craft is stabilizing itself and giving him a pretty good uh, image, and uh, the black of, uh, now he's over the Indian Ocean, 
and he's just over a sunrise and as he continues shooting he'll be taking the same thing as a sunset so we have sunrise effect here now it's a sunset and in a moment you will see it gets to be a clear sunset beyond the horizon on the little pointed area on the right is actually I suppose one might call it the edge of night because it's actually where the light just falls off to a sharp razor edge the reason so many sunsets were photographed there was an interesting uh, observation made by uh, pilots for years a green haze forms immediately over the earth's surface at the exact moment that the sun falls behind the horizon and so this was the first time it was ever Water. recorded in color and what you're doing is just seeing different angles of this same sunset as rapidly mm -hmm. as they can be made by advancing the film it's no wonder that uh, in the old days they thought the uh, earth was flat and everything dropped off. It gives yes, you that impression. Exactly. It's dropping right off Here, the edge. Of course, it's barely discernible, but in the lower left hand of the screen is this very edge of night. Now we're over the Pacific, and uh, Glenn learned quickly that there were very few land areas to be seen. About two thirds of the Earth's surface was covered with clouds. Mm -hmm. And there you see what to me is the finest uh, space picture ever made. This is real space. It's the clouds are there, and this is. You're way up there out of the way. Past everything. Yes. And this is just drifting by. It looks like you can step right out on it. Yes. It? Here is one of the two land masses he photographed. This is the Moroccan coast with the crevice there, or these little lines that you see across. They're actually the uh, uh, Atlas Mountains. And huh. they're about 12. I, I measured them on an Atlas map. And uh, they measure about 12 to 1500 miles. Wow, looks so like you a little see dash. that's the area he's looking at and he's drifting over it quite rapidly and getting uh, uh, quite a few scenes uh, of it. Yeah. Now here is a sequence of 14 pictures taken at 12 second intervals of him actually uh, manipulating the camera and taking exposures. He has the pistol grip in his gloved hand here. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the other problems that he uh, that I thought he would have was they decided to put little uh, flashlight in the tips of his two uh, first fingers of his hand and he s had to use uh, load the film with those little flash bulbs in the uh, in, in both hands they're uh, giving him light those yeah, little he could light up anything in case of failure of other power systems and he managed to snap the pictures and change film with all that gear on his hand. That's hands. right. And in addition, of course, he had to fly by wire for the two orbits, as you all know. I'd say he had now a busy day. Now we're going day. into darkness, and it's unfortunate that you just can't see it in the black and white image, but there's a sunset coming on here, and through. you can barely see the silver sheen from his suit. And now you see it's just the tail end of the sunrise, and now he's into the sunset period which is one of the most beautiful scenes mm. he made. The sausaging effect of the sun is a phenomenon that astronomers are interested in. It seems as the sun goes below the horizon and appears to be on the Earth's surface at this point. Now this is just a change of slides again here, just a continuation of uh, the sunset, sunset series. There we are. Now here is the camera, the Ansco Auto set in complete weightlessness. He laid it down flat above his hand there and while he uses his left hand for another purpose. So here the camera just sets. lays where he sets where he placed it. Blackstone the magician did that for years, that trick. I uh, had hoped that one of these astronauts would set this camera on delayed action and set it out in front of them and take a self-portrait. Uh, uh, self uh, they didn't. They didn't want to do this because they felt they'd have to have a scientific reason for the experiment. <laughs> Here is the Atlantic Ocean again with cloud cover. We're in the last orbit now. And uh, if you set all of these pictures side by side, you see the same cloud mm -hmm. mass from different angles. The purpose of so many cloud pictures was to see whether or not the height of clouds could be determined, be determined by measuring the shadow side of them. Here you're directly over the northern section of Florida. and. Uh, here you can see the Atlantic Ocean in the foreground and a bit of the Gulf of uh, Mexico mm -hmm. in the upper left-hand side. 
Now this is another pass across uh, at a lower angle and you really begin to see, see land. Uh, what 160 miles of earth looks like from 100 miles in the air. That's about how wide it is. And of course this is the real beautiful view, the final parachute just before you drop in water. And this is of course why he exclaimed. And as soon as you are this successful, you report to your leader, <laughs> our leader, and, uh, uh, and this is about the end of this series of slides, but it'll Fine. give you some idea of the wonderful things that are going on in space. Does Colonel Glenn have a copy of all these himself? Well, I'm sure he has. Because uh, anybody wants to trade uh, nights at their houses to show pictures of their recent trips, I guess he could outdo them a bit. Well, too. we hope eventually to make such slides available as part of our space That's promotion right. to people that would like to have That's them. Right. Nobody dare goes up to him and say, uh, listen, I just had a trip to Europe. I'll show you some nice pictures. He says, I'll show you pictures of Europe. Well, he's a wonderful <laughs> person. I uh, listened to his uh, press... Uh, uh, it's okay. Uh, preview or his press presentation in Washington, April 6th, and uh, I was quietly sitting, minding my own business. The room was dark, and I turned around. There he sat, right behind me. And I always carry these photographs just in case. So I said, "My children go to Bell School. Would you mind?" So sure as the Dickens, he wrote, yes, "Best regards to Bell School." Isn't that J. Right? H. Glenn Jr. Wonderful. Nice guy, normal person. And he, I understand he's going to get some sort of award very shortly. Yes, on Friday, the National Press Photographers Association of, of United States is giving him the Photographer of the Year Award for these slides, which he took. This thing you have in your lapel looks like a replica of a uh, space Well, it's a, uh, it's a Mercury spacecraft emblem, and after you, oh, contributed a little bit down there, why someone will give, give you one. one. <laughs> well, we'll be back to our PM and guests in just a couple of moments. It's the second part of PM, and here's Paul Hanover. As they say, time for a change of pace. Thank you. And we have uh, Matt Kennedy's Music Boys all set to go again. And they've got their eyes on the clock as they come up with something called Round Midnight. And indeed, our thanks to Matt Kennedy. Round Midnight, that was called. Well, Phil, I was... Um, how many minutes did it take to flash all those pictures in? It took us about 20, I believe. And how many uh, days did it take to take those? Well, it took uh, him only, what, three orbits, a couple hours yeah. and a half. Are you going to go back again, you think, to Cape Canaveral? Well, I'll go down on the 15th again and see who the next pilot is and what his requirements are. You hope to convince him to stick to the same product, huh? Well, uh, I think uh, that when they look at these, <laughs> the uniformity of these pictures, they're convinced. What's that you have in your hand there? Well, this is a little souvenir of uh, Commander Shepard's flight, which was recorded on our film. And I usually like to give those to people who have children. If you have more than one child, I'll be very happy to give you more. What, what is it? A bank? Oh, it's a little bank. I got two children, but only one of them saves, actually. Well, good. <laughs> then I'll get you another at a later date. Right. I was actually hoping, uh, I was going to hold off for one of those cameras there, but this is the best you can do, I guess. Well, well for the moment, oh. yes, for the moment. Because I'm new on this show. I don't know what the procedure is, usually. <laughs> Let's uh, introduce our next guest. Uh, who uh, represents show business, in particular a very successful and unusual theater venture in the city of Toronto, and he'll tell us all about it. He has some Hamilton connections, by the way, having directed recently the Hamilton uh, Players Guild production of uh, C Caesar and Cleopatra, I believe it was. That's right. So he get, did the Hamilton version of the Elizabeth Taylor story, <laughs> in a way. Let's uh, bring on uh, Ray Lawler. Ray? Welcome. Well, I wonder if you could move over one... Uh, there we are. You, you, that's right. We'll play. That's right. You move over there, and we'll have uh, Ray close to us. Yeah. There we are. That was the floor director's job, really. But oh, well, you didn't want that, eh? So I mixed in where I didn't belong. <laughs> now you know why I'm only on for five days this week. <laughs> Ray, uh, uh, I've been reading. I think it's Herbert Whitaker says. Um, what was that line? That fascinating line about your um, your theater experience there. Oh yes. Well, last um, last evening, how did he put it? He said that. Uh, the newest and most revol revolutionary thing in Toronto theater, more rev revolutionary than uh, Sunday pool, has been the um, opportunity to drink and see drama at the same time. 
Trod the boards, as they say? Oh, I think I was in a sixth grade operetta where we sang, uh, uh, I think I was a butler in long socks and sang, you must cultivate a manner full of dignity with an absence of expression from the eye. I never forgot it. It stayed in your mind. Is he uh, authentic with that? I wouldn't know, really. I've never been in that show. Well, it, it, was, it was a typical... Mm -hmm. School thing, school you know, when, in the days when all school, all grades were in one building, uh, they took the big boys in the class and they made them the men and the little boys were the children, you know, I was a little boy, it's almost I was small. Prophetic for myself, I think the first production I was ever in was Street School and it was uh, all done behind, we were cowards, the whole production was done behind a screen and we passed it off as a radio broadcast in those days. We were afraid uh -huh. to face an audience, but this way you could get the the feel of it over that way. It was almost prophetic since I finally got into the radio business. What was your first uh, that, that convinced you you belong in theater business? It's always interesting. Still photography more, although I've studied quite a bit about photography. I also have gotten quite lazy, and I don't concern myself so much with the technical aspects as I do in just getting good pictures, and automation's brought this about oh, now. Yes. It doesn't take a great deal of skill. Yeah. I still shoot quite a few movies, but I do it in 16 millimeter, and but never in the never. theatrical field. It says here what, that you're from West Windsor, New York, which is near Bingham, and yet you, you live in a place called Peacock Hill. What's that? What's well, uh, I have a pretty good-sized uh, piece of land, and uh, I raise peacocks as a hobby. And <laughs> well. uh, I think you should serve peacock in your... Dell Tavern? Dell Tavern. You mean that the people, that, these beautiful birds with yes, all, that um, NBC uh, hires about a million? Well, they never allow me to mention this on an NBC program, but uh, because this is not nice to eat pretty peacocks, but you don't eat them when they're pretty. What you do with them, if you run them, you know, if they have a tail that long, and you run over them with a car, Thank you. you cook them and throw them away because they're too old. Mm -hmm. But if you uh, uh, dress them out when they're about 10, 12 months old, and if you season them properly and, and good recipes which we use, they make quite a delightful experience, and particularly in New York, where people are all uh, gourmet. You know, they're, they're quite conscious about it. So once a year, we have the annual Ansco Peacock dinner, and uh, we serve uh, oh, 10 to 12 lovely oven-ready birds. I ship them to a um, uh, restaurant there. They prepare, prepare them, them and. We have a ball. Do you uh, raise these commercially? I mean, uh, well, yes. Uh, we have a freezer full all the time. We, you know, you can't do business from an empty wagon. So, <laughs> well, Victor, so. Victor Borg, I know, was big on Cornish hens. I never ever thought the peacocks were done. Uh, well, uh, we at one year uh, were unable to sell them all as fancy for the backyard, you know. So we had to do something with the surplus. So we tried well, whoever, eating them. Whoever tipped you off uh, that uh, that peacocks could be? Well, I think that just because they have the they are pheasants. Oh, they are as stupid as turkeys, <laughs> so they can only taste like one or the other. They eat grain. In other words, uh, they're being as beautiful as they are, they're like all beautiful creatures are dumb. Well, I don't know that I should uh, involve uh, any persons. Invo <laughs> get involved in that little one. And how many? And uh, how many do you raise a year? Well, we have on hand uh, 40 adult birds, the breeders, breeding stock, so to speak, and. We start hatching as soon as they start laying. As soon as they start screaming loudly, three <laughs> weeks later they start laying, you see, because this has an association, this uh, mad screaming that they have. And uh, uh, I, I'd like to tell you just one little peacock story. When we first got the peacocks there, they, of course, scream a thing that sounds like, help, you know. Well, we had a fellow up the road from us that used to come in a little bit under the weather on Friday nights, and his wife would lock him out, and he would lay and sleep on the porch. <laughs> nice neighborhood, yeah? Huh? All this is up the road. I, a neighborhood a mile or two, you see. And I had a nice pond built on the place, and one night the peacock started yelling help, and this man ran a half mile down the road in the stocking feet that night, so I was going to save somebody from the pond. He thought there was uh, some sort of tragedy involved. He thought huh? there was. So uh, do they yell that way because they're pretty big eggs? Is that why? They say? Well, I think That's the old story. <laughs> mythology tells you that they lay, uh, they scream so loud because they can't stand the sight of their feet. <laughs> this is a, I read this somewhere. somewhere. I guess you've done a little research then into the. Well, I collect everything I can from way back when. Uh, I do one thing when we butcher uh, 
12 or 15 of these. I do cut out the tongue, you know, because we understand, you know, the peacock tongues on toast or something. And I send them to oven ready to so friends of mine. Look at this fellow. You never realize that he has this, this, this uh, tortured... Do you ever think of going into the Chinese torture business? Or something? No, I'll tell you. Uh, you like roast beef and you like... You have to kill a cow to eat it. That's right. This is pure and simple. I like salami and people... Uh, and look what they grind up in there. Yeah, what you, you don't even know what goes You only in. saw. Yeah. So what about these peacock tongues? Well, they, of course, uh, we dug up an old recipe somewhere out of the deep, dark Roman past, you know, and, and prepare them for... T and I send the recipe with these little tongues. It's quite exciting to the man on the other end. What a fascinating... Uh, but we uh, uh, also make use of the feathers whenever we have a... Ansco announcement that has special merit. We send the proudest peacock feather out with a release. Does, uh, does is this farm uh, on the, the Ansco uh, expense account or something? The way you keep time. Well, the it's company? quite difficult sometimes to uh, dream up schemes which involve the produce of your farm. <laughs> you know, but I work pretty hard at it. And <laughs> well, I tell you, you've done the you've done the job with that uh, peacock. It always reminds me of the story about the um, the time the football landed in the uh, barnyard. And the rooster took a look at that, took a look at them all angles, finally went after his favorite hand, brought it over, and says, I would take a look at that. Just want you to see what they're doing in other barnyards, you see. <laughs> so I don't think they ever caught up with that one. Well, there is a, there is a, a play pe uh, in regards to peacocks, isn't there? Is, didn't uh, Sean uh, uh, Casey, what's his name, uh, over there in, uh, in Ireland? Oh, well, uh, I've produced that play. I know that. Well, that is called... Juno and the Peacock. Oh, Peacock. And actually it comes, Juno, you see, was, uh, was the wife of, of uh, one of the Apollo. And uh, uh, there was, pe the Peacock was the pet of uh, Hera, who actually is another name for Juno. So that, you see, the Peacock, uh, O'Casey had studied the Greek legends pretty thoroughly and felt that... Uh, the husband, the captain of Juno, was more, was a, a, a peacock from that point of view, and also because the captain was always strutting and bragging. As a, as a peacock. And, uh, as, as a peacock, peacock. yes. Oh, All right. Peacock. So uh, do you, uh, would you recommend this as, as an interesting hobby? Oh, yes, uh, so long as you don't have neighbors within a half mile of you. If they say whispering, he raises peacocks and eats them, things like that. Can, this can devalue the real estate in no time. Well, faster. I think it has a tendency in that direction. You didn't bring any pictures of them along, though? No, I, I, I'll gladly send you some. <laughs> you have any youngsters, by the way? Yes, I have uh, several. Well, here, I'd like to uh, present this to your youngster. It's a <laughs> little bank. Now, when he gets that filled, he can send it back of American money. <laughs> well, I ain't having any money to save, you see. I left it all at the customs office on, on Sunday. On the way in. Well, I think we've uh, enjoyed your fascinating pictures, uh, and you're leaving for this part of the, the country when? Tomorrow night. Tomorrow you're back to uh, Bing Bing Binghamton. Binghamton, yes. New York. And um, no doubt you'll be down there preparing some more pictures before long. I hope you'll be on able to make the trip. On the 15th of the month, I go back down because it looks like the next shot will be... Oh, the like didn't September. Didn't, uh, didn't you ever have any hazardous experiences there? Well, yeah. uh, no. It, it gets kind of monotonous sitting there all the time. It gets real hot this time of the year That's down right. there, but no hazardous experiences. I, uh, I've got so I'm a sort of a commuter there. You know, I take pictures of clouds from jet flights going back and forth, and uh, I always ride tourists uh, because it's the only difference is you get uh, cold scrambled eggs and tourists to get warm in <laughs> yeah, first class. But in taking these cloud pictures, I uh, also am, am able to show these to the astronauts. What about, um, uh, because you've been there so often, do you have a chance to make application to take a trip up there someday? No, but I'd sure like to get an ANSCO release in one of those. Go up there. Huh? Ones. Well, uh, I hope that our show got into orbit uh, this evening. On PM, our guests from the United States, Phil Mikado, and from Theatre in the Dell in Toronto, we have uh, Ray Lawler, and uh, that's all from Paul and PM. Good night. That's all.